So, hello and welcome. And today we are guests of Frank, our dear friend and professor, who don't want me to call you a professor, but for me you are a professor. Sorry, Frank, I just because I, for the first time in my life, I met someone who know about Chinese music so much. And they even made already a great event in our tea house uh, with uh, Frank and also perfect, uh, fantastic musician, Xu uh, Fengxia, yeah, from, from Germany. And today we will talk a little bit about uh, Chima, your organization, about the research of Chinese music and also about you. Maybe you talk about, say a few words about yourself. How did you get into Chinese music especially? Well, that was because I, um, I met my future wife uh -huh. in a student choir here in Leiden. I was working as a journalist, but I didn't know many people yet in Leiden. And so I joined that choir to mm -hmm. get around a bit more. I met a girl who was studying Chinese here, mm -hmm. which was really a, a world I didn't know at all. Mm -hmm. But we got acquainted and um, after a while we got into a relationship. She left for a whole year to China and I thought that was rather long. <laughs> so halfway down that period when she was studying in, at uh, Nanjing University, I decided to go and visit her. And that visit to China was such an overwhelming experience. It was like arriving on the moon. Mm -hmm. I thought that China was so different from all the countries that I'd been to up to that moment. And um, I was absolutely taken. We both loved music very much. And from that, the idea grew. She had to pick an idea, a topic for a, for a dissertation. Uh, and we thought maybe collecting rural folk music could be an interesting, uh, mm -hmm. an interesting corner, an interesting perspective for her. So uh, we did some trips to the countryside together while, while I was there and I was so impressed by what I saw and I loved it so much yeah. that basically I gave up journalism after that and I decided to focus entirely on, on China to uh, to cooperate with her. So basically, um, we did the dissertation together. <laughs> and um, of course, it appeared under her name, but everyone knew that we were working together on that. And um, that was the start of all these other things. Yeah. And which years it was? This, uh, well, I think it started in the 1980s, um, mm. her dissertation. You know, we took 10 years. Wow. Uh, that well, is still old-fashioned, yeah, it's still wow. old-fashioned uh, university-style uh, behavior, you know, <laughs> to, to, to take such a long time. But that was because we also set up this archive, we set up a platform for, you know, uh, other scholars in Europe that uh, who turned out to be doing uh, research on Chinese music and we began to organize concerts. It basically ran out of hand in a very pleasant way. We did too many things and it, mm -hmm. so it cost us a lot of time, but it was very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how Chima started? It was like a first step for Chima? Well, you know, we, we went to some conferences that were related to Chinese music. We met other people and in the beginning, I think there were maybe 10 people in Europe dealing with this. You know, it was a <laughs> rather exotic topic. Yeah. But and we started a newsletter, and we thought maybe there will only be one, <laughs> one issue of that because what is there to tell? Yeah. But uh, the number of people who deal with Chinese music has been growing very quickly, and mm -hmm. so it's a bigger, it's a bigger amount of people now, and um, so uh, the platform still has its functions. And now when we when we meet once a year in, in a university in Europe or in America or even in China, depending on mm -hmm. where we organize it, um, you can have 80, 100, even up to 150 people uh, joining. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, for an international conference, it's a very modest number, but I think it's quite nice. It shouldn't be bigger than that. So it's very international so, um, community, actually. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. So it's so from everywhere. It's from everywhere. And of course, you know, Chinese people should investigate their own music mm -hmm. and they should do it. They are cl closest to it. Mm -hmm. But I think the nice thing is that as, a f as foreigners, you have a somewhat different perspective, a different mm -hmm. background that can help 
to understand certain aspects of the music better in the way we also need to cooperate with Chinese because they know certain things much better than we do. So it's it's in the exchange that you get a, a very nice uh, outcome. I see. So you, during this uh, travel, so it was like which provinces mostly visited? Oh, uh, well, you know, for a dissertation, you have to focus yeah. on a specific area. So we were 10 years in uh, in Jiangsu, in the, the southern part of uh, Jiangsu, it's called Jiangnan, uh -huh. the, the territory of many famous novels. Uh -huh. And, you know, it's a it's a it's it's a it's a rich and wealthy part of China, uh -huh. uh, although it is mostly countryside, but uh, there's a lot of a lot of culture there. Uh, Jiangnan is famous for its paintings, yeah. for its for its uh, literary scene, but there's also a lot of great music there. Yeah. And we've we collected folk songs in that area, but most of the people that we um, that we uh, found there were in their 70s and 80s. Oh. So they were basically for us singing what they remembered from their youth. But we wanted to see what folk singing would be like in parts of China where it was still part of a vibrant scene rather than something remembered. So after 10 years, after after she finished her dissertation, um, we moved to Gansu in, uh -huh. in the northwest because in that area there were still temple festivals, uh, there were all sorts of rituals mm -hmm. in which folk songs were still sung also by young people and we could see it in, in a more vibrant situation. Uh, but we've been to other, we've been to Shanxi and to Yunnan, to other Sichuan, yeah. to other parts of China also to either to collect folk songs or to investigate other types of music because, you know, once you, it's it's like a big dish and you yeah. want to eat all of it. Yeah, There's so it's much. In, it's impossible almost, you know. It's impossible to do. <laughs> I mean, if people call me an expert on Chinese music, I always say, no, that's impossible. You cannot be an expert on Chinese yeah. music because that's like being an expert on European music. What does yeah. that mean? You know, yeah. there's too much. Yeah. You cannot be an ex expert on, let's say, Bulgarian folk <laughs> music and uh, Bartok and Stravinsky and the Rolling Stones. And yeah. I mean, there's too much. Yeah, yeah, so I, we can only do bits and pieces, but um, we have done quite a broad range. Um, apart from the folk songs, we have done a number of elite genres that were really more in the, let's say, the range of intellectual people who do this as a, as a kind of sophisticated uh, hobby, you might say, or lifetime passion. Uh, we've done uh, contemporary music, uh, avant-garde music, so composers. Which is very um, interesting, actually. Absolutely. Oh yes, but Sufjan, it was wonderful well, how she know, combined this uh, classical Gujarian and. Uh, but you know that is the fun of doing research in China that you can go to and fro between the countryside, between mm -hmm. the rural, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. the roots of Chinese music and what what people in urban areas are doing with it and how they are developing it in, in, in new ways. And, and it's, it's, it's very gratifying to see those extremes and everything mm -hmm. that's yeah. in between it. So we've also investigated tea house ensembles and um, in the tea houses, the Jiangnan Sidru, we have um, looked at um, shadow puppetry and oh, other forms of, of yes, uh, puppet plays, marionettes uh, in, in Fujian in the south. You know, there is so much, there's too much. Uh, yeah, one life is not is, enough. Actually, I, I completely have the same feeling because uh, also like spending 10 years on tea and uh, I was focused on mostly Yunnan, Fujian, uh, maybe a little bit uh, Sichuan. Guizhou, no, all these uh, territories which belongs provinces belongs to tea production. But for example, I never went to Gansu, uh -huh. and, I, and I wasn't in uh, Jiangsu, but only in Wuxi and uh, Yixin city, uh, Jinshu Yeah, that yeah. that's where they have yeah. the famous tea pots. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. But <laughs> only this area actually. Yeah. So if you talk about Jiangsu, I was in the north. There is some production of of the glass. But uh, and and this Uxi region I know very nice, but only this small region. So it's I really can imagine. Uh, I also I can spend like a month there and just research about uh, 100 uh, artists, but there's still yeah. more uh, 20,000 of them. Yeah. I didn't see them. Yeah. And uh, yeah. like a masters who doing pottery. So this is yeah. very easy example of how how rich is uh, culture Absolutely. there. It's like yeah. you can go into deep ocean and uh, just yeah. 
take few drops and it's like all your life in, in these drops, you know. Yunnan, Yunnan was a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. We actually went there to be uh, away from the cold, you mm -hmm. know, for a short time. We, I was there in the winter, mm -hmm. so um, we spent most of the time in Jiangnan, but it's very cold. If you yeah, go yeah, to yeah. the, you know, you go to the countryside, there's yeah. no heating anywhere. Yes, yeah, so no heating, but and it's zero you know, outside. People would, would sit there with bottles with hot water in their jackets just to keep warm. So after a few weeks, and of course we got a bad cold and we, f we fell ill and we had all the... But then we went to Yunnan for a short period and Yunnan was so fantastic. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing, and you, might, you must have seen that as well, uh, yeah. people in, in the fields. Ah, yeah, yeah, these yeah. minority girls, yeah, you know, in yeah, their yeah. incredibly beautiful dresses, yeah. working in the mud, you know. They and you, they're still wearing it, actually. It's, and, it's, yeah. and you see these very dark, they have these very dark skinned faces faces because they are out in the sun a lot. Yeah. So beautiful, you yeah. know, with these rosy cheeks and try to make pictures, but they would like, woof, they they would really yeah. flee for my camera. Yeah, yeah. You was uh, there like, much like earlier. There. It was 90s, I believe. I yeah, I was in the, uh, this was uh, 86. I Oof. was there, yeah, 86, <laughs> 87. Was 20 years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, China has changed enormously. You know, when I, when I was there the first time, I was so jealous of Heather Morrison. She was a photographer in the 1930s uh -huh. and I saw all these pictures and of her on a donkey or on wow. a camel and I thought wow she was in the China where where the bandits were still you know riding yeah. camels and yeah. where you could be robbed and so on and so forth but I actually you know I didn't I I had a sort of sense of now you know we're at the end of history yeah. and we yeah. are in modern China and yeah. Actually, the the China that I I saw in the 1980s doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. now. it's all completely. gone. Yeah. It's completely gone. And the things that I saw, the tea houses where you know where all these Sujo, old guys, yeah. they were all wearing Mao yeah. jackets, and you didn't pay attention to it then. But when I come back to the tea houses now, it's a totally different audience, a totally different atmosphere. Yeah. Everything has changed. Yeah. Everything is a, it's a, again a totally different world. So. Yeah. I, I suppose that people who go to China now uh, ought to be jealous of me seeing it, yeah. <laughs> what it was like in the 1980s, you yeah, know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. it will keep changing. It's, it's an incredibly dynamic country. In some ways, it changes slowly and the sort of foundation of, of Chinese beliefs and attitudes will always be there in good ways and bad ways, you mm. know, it's like with any society. but. In other ways, it's changing like incredibly fast, like like they're building the roads underneath your feet while you yeah. walk there. You know, it's it's incredible how <laughs> yeah, fast yeah, yeah. things go. Yeah. So it's this strange mixture. But yeah, I'm I'm still fascinated. I'm still when I walk around in, in China today, I think, wow, incredible that I can be here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. really, it's really actually really... now we can start value this much more when the COVID came. Yeah. And I just uh, almost uh, three years. I, yeah. well, I not don't went to China and I feel very big miss. But actually I just a small trick. Uh, maybe it's not in our topic, but in the northern uh, Thailand, there's a big uh, Chinese communities. And I just uh, already for a third time now going there because also tea. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I want to maybe research a little spend some more time just to have similar feeling you know because yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. like unite yeah. a little bit but, but when you go there do you go uh, with on your own or, or do or you bring your wife or do you now now i bring my family yeah because we you have know, a project for, there so for me it i i always greatly admire researchers who who do research on their own because it's quite tough you know yeah. in a in an environment that you don't know and I've always been together with my wife because she was, of course, she knew the language well mm -hmm. before I began to mm -hmm. learn it. And she was, so she was basically, you know, my mouthpiece. And mm -hmm. uh, she was also, uh, she had a fantastic way of communicating with people, which really helped her to, to mm -hmm. find answers and to get deep into the society. But she, unfortunately, she died of cancer in 2012. Yeah. And um, from that time onward, I had to sort of reset myself and decide mm -hmm. 
am I still going to China? Will mm. I be able to do that? I did manage in the first years to go there, but only in urban areas because uh -huh. I felt a little bit more close to, you know, I could understand the language better uh -huh. and it was easier for me to move around. For field work in the countryside, I was a bit afraid because I thought no matter whom I cooperate mm -hmm. with, I will always be reminded of how well, you it know, things went life. with my wife. But in, in recent years, before the COVID, of course, um, I had some lucky situations where I work together with mostly with with uh, Chinese uh -huh. and um, the interesting fact was that whenever I found out that I could not understand uh -huh. local people that I tried to interview uh -huh. they couldn't understand that you know the interpreters couldn't understand them as well so, yes, yes. <laughs> so that yeah, was yeah, a very yeah, sort yeah. of comforting experience. I, I have a certain experience <laughs> in the uh, United Province when I visit uh, some small village called Pinjai, I still remember even the name in, in Wenshan district. It's like uh, eastern part of Yunnan province, and it's very close to border with uh, Vietnam already. Mm -hmm. And uh, we was also for tea there, yeah. there was some tea. Yeah. And uh, it was the first time in my life when I, we went to maybe twelve places there, and no right. one understand my Putunghua, yeah. yeah. and no one understand my driver's Putunghua. Too, you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> because he's yes. from Fujian, but he even his his Punhua even worse than mine. <laughs> you so, know, yes, I, I remember my first. We had our first interview with the puppet players in uh, Gansu, mm -hmm. and that was a long interview with seven old men. Mm -hmm. And Antoinette was asking, my wife was asking them questions and in and between, I was filming and I was asking her, so what are they telling you? She said, quiet, quiet, and she didn't want to interrupt. And after the interview, I finally could ask her, so what were they talking about? And she said, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I have one. no idea. <laughs> I heard that for many times because you just listen in the corner and we got a guest here, so we, of course, we listen. But we yeah, but understand. just imagine, you know, we collected like 19 hour, 90 hours of film uh -huh. in the span of a number of years. And of course, not all of that was as difficult, but when we started making our film, editing our film, Antoinette, my wife, would regularly make phone calls to China and she would say, well, this guy is saying, and then she would imitate his speech. Uh -huh. And they would say, because she would phone people who, are, who were familiar with the local dialect, and they would say, oh, he's saying this or that. And that's the way we could, Crazy. you know, sort of supplement the translation. It's, yeah, the, you just have to use your hands and your feet and, and try to make the best of it. That's the only way you can do the field work. But I'm, yeah, you are familiar with that uh, because you're in a similar situation. Yeah. Looks like uh, when you visit all this region, especially rural areas, you maybe was well, like one foreigner in maybe a few decades, uh, there, like a first foreigner, because it was after reopening of China. Yes, just uh, yes, the same time, yeah? uh, certainly in the 1980s, you know, yeah. people would pluck at my wife's hair because they'd yeah. never seen a hairy woman, you know, that there was something <laughs> like, uh, very, but we sometimes made the mistake to ask. I remember in one village in Jiangnan, we asked, so are we the first, f are we the first foreigners here? And they said, well, you know, we had a few, <laughs> a few Japanese <laughs> and we thought, oh my uh, God, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> the Japanese war, of course, they yeah, have yeah. had their, their awful experiences, but, um, yeah, in many places we were, we were really, it was difficult because sometimes we were so, you know, when you appeared somewhere, everyone was staring at you, you got yeah. an enormous crowd around you. Yeah. And you can't do your research, you know, you can't film, you can't yeah, do anything. Yeah, you can't lawai, lawai. Yeah, lawai, lawai, lawai. <laughs> <laughs> if you stay on, and that's of course the trick, you go back to places. Mm -hmm. You don't go there once, you go there many times. You have to ask the same questions over and over again. Mm -hmm. Once is not enough. And when you see a certain consistency appearing in the answers, then you are onto something. But you cannot go for what people tell you, you know, that's if, if you just take everything for granted, then then you get very weird results from your research because yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't know what you want. Mm -hmm. They don't understand you, you know, they don't, they cannot value the, the meaning of your question. So they try to, to do their best, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily get the answers you need. And actually, I found out that the best way of interviewing people is not mm -hmm. to ask any questions at all. Uh -huh. The best way is to invite 
a number of people you find interesting to your hotel or the place you stay, Jada I saw, whatever it is, let them talk together. And you just record them and then you translate what they're saying to one another. And you get fantastic information, much wow. better than any you could ask, uh, you yeah. know, so... <laughs> because actually there was a habit uh, from maybe also communist era, like if some official or some like a uh, special researcher arrived, so we need answer is in certain way yes. you know, like like yes. spe especially more yes. official way answering well yeah. <laughs> you know there would be simple things like they are foreigners mm -hmm. they cannot understand me ah yeah this yeah. idea and so you would address them in chinese and mm -hmm. they would not address you back but they would address an official or someone else who was in your company mm -hmm. you know yeah, so yeah, 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 even yeah. to establish that direct link could be difficult we would go to villages where they would sing uh, communist songs for us, you know, all these mm -hmm. propaganda songs. And then also you would say, actually. of course, and we would be, well, you, sometimes you collected songs that were in favor of the Guomindang, you know, yeah. you say, wow, you know, you have that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or statements about the Japanese being very good to them and building roads for them, you know. Well, um, if I wanted to subvert Chinese history, you, you, you know, you can, you can get very interesting. But, uh, you know, the second evening they might sing love songs for you mm -hmm. and if you stay on a, bit, a little bit longer than the third evening they sing the erotic songs and you oh, know wow. the pornographic ones oh, and wow. um, no problem they will do it in the presence of children you know every age is <laughs> is you know there's there's a public situation there all the time and they are also willing to write down the lyrics of those songs for you mm -hmm. but don't ask them what they mean that is the point where, you know, when, the, when you ask them to explain the metaphors, it can become sort of sensitive and then they don't want to because that is somehow threatening. But yeah. OK, we have other people for that. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> who can en entrepreneur? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course, you know, they are normal people. They sing about everything under the sun. You know, they think about everything under the sun like you and me. But um, but of course, uh, there is a certain amount of, of caution when it comes to certain topics mm -hmm. which are problematic or they, the, it's part of their tradition mm -hmm. and in their tradition it's fine. But when you come as a researcher, of course, you're sort of yeah. extracting it and that yeah, yeah. already makes... Uh, we've, we've been to temple festivals where people would ask us, please be careful with this material that you're filming don't share it with the authorities you know mm -hmm. because they're afraid that they will come and forbid their rituals I or, see. and that has been happening so wow. so um, sometimes we really had to be careful um, you know here you can publish what you want and there's no no one going to read that stuff because it's academic you know yeah. academic stuff is something that nobody reads anyway so <laughs> <laughs> actually you know this is why actually we're trying to a little bit uh, take this academic stuff on a little bit more wider audience just to show up because when I just uh, I never knew about you if, if not Fred and uh, German told me about your uh, organization. It's but so... I think that scholars should go out and should really yeah. present their materials to a wider audience because the mm -hmm. audience of academics that's an in crowd but mm -hmm. you're not doing it for the in crowd you're mm -hmm. doing to to expose that material yeah. to a wider audience because it's interesting it's worthwhile mm -hmm. and I'm yeah sometimes a little bit dis disappointed with academic writing because it's so inward looking and so mm -hmm. full of jargon and so so little productive mm -hmm. um, not all of it I mean some of it is splendid but but there's also a lot of rubbish around yeah. uh, just write for writing but not for uh, someone will use it or someone mm -hmm. will uh, read it whatever yeah it's it's then sort of going in a circle of, of academic readers, academic mm -hmm. public, but sometimes I think one should really go uh, beyond that and mm -hmm. present those materials to wider audiences. It's mm -hmm. important. You have to show what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I'm not paid by anyone, but uh, most scholars are, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, show the taxpayer why, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. why they should support you, right? Yeah, 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 That's yeah. important. Um, no, we were lucky that my wife was well off, so we could support ourselves and we could mm -hmm. spend a lot of time on research that mm -hmm. not everyone can, can do that way. Mm -hmm. 
because sometimes you depend on grants or you depend on them. Yeah. yeah, 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 about some of the writing being rather dry and just for a small group of people and yeah. Well, you know, sometimes it's wonderful if you have an author who writes this book of 3,000 pages about <laughs> some Tibetan special ritual and there are seven people in the world who are dying to read it. Yeah. Okay, that's also <laughs> fine, you know, that's also fine, yeah. but there should be a balance and I think some of it, you know, could be for a wider audience so that yeah. we know what it's all for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something yeah. In, in the middle maybe, it's also kind, kind of not just the upper layer as it often when you just see this uh, very, very small layer of uh, yeah. very mostly use this information yeah. which is not give you a, a picture but then you go too deep at the same time you can't uh, yeah. take any picture at all because you just need to read like yeah. Yeah, three five thousand pages about a very specific well, it's, issue it's difficult to get a sense of what is going on in a society that you know little about you need mm -hmm. time to grow into it mm -hmm. i think the first two years we barely knew where we were mm -hmm. You know, it takes years to understand, to, to even begin to build an understanding with a country like China. Now I've been going there for 30 years on and off and, you know, lived there for longer periods. Basically, do I understand China? I would say that I'm beginning to understand it. Yeah, and yeah. I'm by going into the language, mm -hmm. I feel that I'm discovering certain basic things about China that I'm only beginning to discover now. So it's it's an ongoing process. It's like discovering who you are yourself, you know. Yeah. That's also an endless, it's unending process. So <laughs> endless research. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's and it's not because China is mysterious, you know. Yes, it is, but no more mysterious than you or me. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think there's there are depths everywhere. It's, you know, I feel it's the challenge to, to take up those, mm -hmm. those questions and to try what you can find out, to go deeper and deeper. People often take what they collect on face value. So they present a collection of music and say, this is what I found. And then they project all sorts of theories on it about our cultural identity and all mm -hmm. these other things. But I think that's a useless exercise. Mm. You have to find out why people are singing, why they are singing it this way rather than that way, how people perceive the music they listen to, why people would want to listen to it. And those are not easy questions at all because mm -hmm. you can't ask it. You can ask people, okay, why are you listening to this? But they cannot answer that, you know? Yeah. They don't theorize about it. And sometimes it takes you 10 years or more to even begin to understand why it is happening. So there are many situations where we have really been baffled, absolutely baffled by the things we found. By the time my wife was defending her dissertation, people in the committee asked her questions about, so why, why is it the way you describe? What is your own? And she wasn't able to answer that. Mm -hmm. But we have the answers now, you know, 10 years further on, you begin to understand why certain things are like that. I'm still struggling with a lot of questions, but we're making some progress. And what is your plans when China will be open? Well, you know, where, my, where you want to go? <laughs> oh, gosh, I want to go so many places, but I have unfinished business in Gansu mm -hmm. because uh, we did a lot of research on temple festivals there. We wanted to understand the relationships between the love songs they're singing in the temple mm -hmm. festivals mm -hmm. and the temples rituals themselves. Mm -hmm. Why do people sing love songs near temples? Wow. You know, that is a question. And I think I know the answer, but in order to really answer that, we need to do a lot of research. Actually, I need 100 people uh -huh. to come with me there to go to all the temples, because there are temples where they sing love songs and there are temples where they don't. Uh -huh. And I have to investigate both, but there are hundreds of temples there. I can never do all that. So. So I have some uh, clue that this is related to the specific creeds, the specific um, worship, specific mm -hmm. gods that they worship in those temples. I think that certain creeds are related to the songs, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but I can't prove it. For that I need more data. And it's very hard because nowadays you go to a temple, you talk to a temple guard, you say, mm -hmm. so what God is there inside? Do I know? You know, this is Lao Ye, this is old granddad, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. that's how we call him. Oh, and yeah. they don't have the knowledge anymore, you know. Yeah. And and an older generation is dying who would have known or would have been able to tell you which gods are being worshipped. This is getting hard. Yeah. You have to realize that all the temples in the areas where I'm doing research had metal placards mm -hmm. where you could see the history of the temples, I see. the history of the gods that were venerated there. These were all melted, you know, wow. during the during the what they called the Great Leap Forward. Yeah. They were all because it was iron and you know the Great Leap Forward was about recasting that iron and building a big iron industry. They literally burned their history. Crazy. And I've, I've been asking around, did nobody take photographs? And people said, who had cameras at that time? You know, Crazy. so much. And OK, there is part of it is in marble and stone. And if yeah. that is still around, if it's not been smashed, because yeah. lo lots of things were smashed. Yeah, I see this uh, wooden. Uh, I said so, I have some wooden carvings because I also bought uh, the, for decoration of the clubs. And often all these faces of Guan Yin or Buddha or even just the people around just smashed. The Scratched, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I met a, a guy who, who grew up as a schoolboy in Gansu. He was asked by his teacher to help demolish temples because that was in that period, you know. Crazy. And that's even before the Cultural Revolution. We're talking before about the, the yeah, before the cultural everyone thinks that the Cultural Revolution was the destroy No, it started much earlier. He later regretted it so much uh -huh. that he had been helping. He he was forced to do it, you know, as a uh -huh. kid. He could not do it. So he had to do it. But afterwards, he got it. He became a businessman and he began to rebuild those temples with wow. his own hands. You know, he invested wow. all the money he earned. Such a great story. Um, actually, with, with tea houses and places he you knows somewhat similar to what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And he would rebuild temples so that he would, you know, yeah. basically do something back for all the... I remember climbing one mountain in uh, in Gansu about, well, it must have been 2017. And it was very funny, you know, a huge mountain and we were coming down from the top and I suddenly heard my, my name shouted wow. and I thought, who knows me here? It's just so strange. It was a guy I didn't know, but he remembered me from an interview I'd done with his father, that guy, wow. 18 years before. 18 years. 18 years before and but you know there were not many foreigners climbing that mountain yeah, yeah. so he saw me and he recognized me and I said is your dad still alive and he said yes he's still alive but he's 80 plus now and he's old and frail I said we must phone him so I phoned him and he was crying on the phone he said oh I want to see you and I said well if you tell me where you're staying now no 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 I'm coming to you I'm coming over to you I said it's you know it's festival time here it's crowded and yeah. No problem. The next day he was there and, and we started walking, uh, you know, in the temple festival area and he was holding my hand, uh -huh. you know. He was so happy to see me and I couldn't help crying, you know. Mm -hmm. I was so moved by the fact that apparently the fact that we interviewed him had meant so much to him yes. that he never forgot it. You uh, know? Actually, actually, this yeah. is also, I, mean, I also found that uh, even with very small interaction with some Chinese farmers, uh, when I met them and they sometimes i didn't see them for a few years and they're still writing me and asking how oh, am yeah. i and i yeah. also try to reply all of them and uh, somehow to continue the relations because guanxi actually guanxi in chinese in yeah. china it's very important and they and they value that really that they see that especially if you love their culture they really value that, that. absolutely the same as tea and, is also culture. and and it's something that people inside china who are you know the official cultural officials are not mm -hmm. always very you know they have a superficial sort of interest mm -hmm. but it doesn't go very deep necessarily and I always say that China is like a, a man without a memory you know there's mm -hmm. so much memory loss
-hmm. so ma so many things you're not supposed to talk about you know it's not just the cultural revolution it's the whole mao period it's actually the cultural past except in a sort of monolithical way you know mm -hmm. people talk about li shi you know there's a long history yeah. to our country but it's it's a black box you know it's yeah. venerated but people are not allowed to look inside they're not allowed to actually reflect yeah. on what happened in certainly not in the la in the past 80 years or so that's a, uh, something you cannot really touch upon so if you talk about these things with people you you are really appreciated because then finally someone is going yeah, to, to talk about all the things that happened and everything that took place. I mean, that particular area in Gansu during the Cultural Revolution was the scene of, of actual battles wow. between people who wanted to continue with the temple uh, wow. festivals and Red Guards. Wow. who wanted to stop them. You know, they have so been fi literally I, I, fighting. I didn't, why yes, didn't you know wow. yes. You know, and the rituals themselves are a matter of life and death. You, you think of rituals as something, you know, it's to do with the religious creed, so either it's you like believe or you don't. It's a tradition from century to century, we just go... Uh, Everything is related to it, you know. Yeah. What happens in a temple festival is not just about, uh, you know, venerating a yeah. god. The Communist Party comes to hold its conference there, because it's closer to the gods and it's the right wow. time to do it because it's, uh, you know, it's a beneficial time. Uh, people come to negotiate about the relative hierarchy of villages and cities in wow. the relationship to the temples. You know, the temples used to be the centers mm -hmm. of power. Mm -hmm. Of course, that has changed, but it has not completely changed. Wow. Temples are, still have an enormous impact. Yeah. When you talk about Tibetans or, let's say, minority peoples, yeah, I mean, if somebody gets murdered or, you know, some, some dramatic event takes place, mm -hmm. they don't go to, to the police, they go to the temples, you know, and the temple, the temple people will have to decide about these matters. Wow. And of course, there is, a, yeah, there is a formal, there are authorities in, in place now, and that's, of course, the party and that's the government and so on. But don't underestimate the power that still relies mm -hmm. in these rituals, in the, let's say, in the, in the, in the traditional contexts. Mm -hmm. A lot of that has been destroyed by the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And that's also one reason why you're not supposed to talk about these things, yeah. you know. When they went to the villages in the, in the 1930s, you know, well yeah. before communism was yeah. formally established, they didn't want to cooperate with the temple associations because wow. they wanted to establish their own people. They want I to see. basically have their own control, people in charge. Actually, yeah. control, it was all about control. So the temple associations were disbanded. They sent away people. They destroyed temples. Well, you undermine the total social structure of, of villages and of rural areas in that way. Mm -hmm. That history is not written. Or it's not completely written. I mean, there are some yeah. books about it here in the West, but you cannot read about it in China yeah. because you're not supposed to talk about it. So, and then, then we're talking about 80 years ago or, or longer, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's like, really like sad. The just, just switch with period <laughs> and the well, go forward. <laughs> that's why I'm saying that China is like a, like a man without a memory. It's, mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. You know, and even like contemporary culture, people mm -hmm. doing traditional instruments. Yeah, they play mm -hmm. traditional instruments, you know, they, they mm -hmm. study traditional instruments in the conservatory. But what do they know about the history of their own instruments? Yeah. You know, people who play a, a modern repertoire on the pipa or on mm -hmm. the on the jung mm -hmm. are not necessarily aware even of the sort of repertoires that are played on these same instruments in the countryside. It's wow. a very, very remote, remote. Uh, there is there is an enormous gap. If you compare that to Africa, uh, where pop musicians in urban areas go mm -hmm. to the countryside, or people from the countryside, you know, with their xylophones and yeah, their drums, yeah. go to the urban areas to play together with pop yeah. musicians. It's a totally different situation. Yeah, and China is it's diverse, much more, yeah. and, and, and China is so compartmentalized in that way. It's so broken, so broken up. And that makes, makes it very hard for culture to develop. But actually maybe it also, you know, 
because China all the time it was really separated also because of the landscape it's so mountains everywhere and also the roads was not built as good as now and also this is why we have so much dialects so many different kitchens even on some traditions and they all like uh, very fragmented like in this uh, then it's like that and just to drive 20 kilometers kilometers and they have already other dialect you that's know? true that's so maybe true. It not only because they are not uh, want uh, to go or they just uh, maybe prefer to stay there and just just well like yes so. but then i think to some extent what you're talking about is simply provincialism mm -hmm. and provision provincialism is everywhere you know yeah. you can find even in holland you yeah. think holland is modern urbanized yeah. and so on but of course if you go to the countryside here you can also find a sort of attitude of yeah. you know we we want to be on our own we want to that's that seems to be of all periods all times of course it's much stronger in areas where the landscape sort of yeah, yeah. creates yes. natural gaps and so you would find more of it in Switzerland than in Holland yeah, because yeah. here we are completely flat yeah. but uh, yeah of course but I think it's also something in the Chinese mentality there mm. and it, you know because even within urban context let's say one conservatory doesn't have a lot of contact with another conservatory yeah. within the conservatory one department doesn't have a lot of con contact with <laughs> another department within one department one teacher stay off my students you know yeah. they are with me not with you <laughs> i mean this this seems this this yeah. seems to be fragmented to to a degree that is really frightening mm -hmm. even among students you know students can be friends they can talk about their love relationships mm -hmm. and everything they can be quite open but when it comes to jobs and to applying for jobs your your fellow student is suddenly your competitor and you are like <laughs> enemies you know yeah. the competition is so extreme in china yeah. uh -huh. it's so extreme that creates a lot of problems it's not easy to be young in china it's not easy to be young here or in any in any society but i think the pressures in china are more extreme yeah and there's more competition much there's more. more competition there's also more pressures and more expectation you know parents for a long time had only yeah. one child so that one child had to do everything yes. you know a, a country without brothers and sisters a totally crazy situation and you can see that i mean all the students that i've worked with either it's my problem because you know i'm i'm a crazy person mm -hmm. but my impression is uh, they all have mental problems they all oh. you know they all have their psychiatrists or therapeutes because they have to so many face stress. this they have to face all these pressures from their education from their parents from the environment and it's really tough it's really yeah. tough so yeah it's it's also really yeah, a tragic, tragic society in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, what we can say that, uh, yeah, also, also I, I met some youngsters uh, in China, but mostly in rural areas. Mm -hmm. But some of them are learned in, uh, like, in university, for example, for the, as a tea technologist. And uh, they work really so hard. Oh, yeah. We work so hard, so we, we try, they, and this is became a habit. So this is a, what we can say a good thing about uh, these methods of education and how really they dependent on this pressure and we ha feel it all the time yeah. they also work really hard because of this because they if they have a habit to try all the time to be competitive yeah. anything yeah. yeah and this is why we gain this results now so this yeah. also I think it's there is some dependence on this well, it's, you know, if, if mm -hmm. you want to summarize uh, China in one word, then it's contrast. Because, yeah. yes, you find extreme laziness and extreme <laughs> discipline, extremely yeah. hardworking people. And yeah, I mean, uh, my best friends live in China. The people I really admire most, love most, they're all, they happen to be Chinese. Yeah. And um, in many ways, I also feel it's a culture that we can learn tremendously lot from, you know, yeah. in their philosophy, in their literature, in, yeah, in the, in the kindness I meet, in, 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 in the, the places where, where I do my research. In many ways, there is so much fantastic civilization there. Yeah. All civilization and, and, and people where you feel that they 
sort of personally carry the weight of of uh, of an old culture in in mm. their personality in the way they behave mm. and that is what makes me love china mm. but when i talk to young people and i say that i love china they don't know what i'm talking about they say yeah. really you know yeah. because they have so All many this authoritarian yes, they, but they, they have so <laughs> many things they have to face and, and mm. i say yeah i understand i see the the, the dark side of china but maybe because i'm not have to live in it every day mm -hmm. i can also be more detached and also appreciate mm -hmm. more the let's say the the, the many positive mm -hmm. aspects of of that culture it's mm -hmm. really fascinating it's mm -hmm. fantastic so yeah, yeah. yeah people I, i only if we just uh, we're talking about very specific things you make like this very targeted research on of ethnic folk music and me for example also made uh, also very targeted research on tea and and it's so small uh, like a piece of all the big uh, cake of chinese culture if you talk like a complete thing and it's really like uh, something completely different and uh, yeah it's you uh, made very good compassion about europe and china uh, because also also i I'm, i feel this uh, uh, some even similar compassion yeah. because I never traveled to Europe for a long time uh, only four years ago I first time arrived to Western Europe you know and uh, but before I was almost 10 years in China in the same period right and I, and I feel this also like from country to country here is the same like from province to province in China so it's yeah some some similarity yeah. And also rich culture the same way. And yeah, you know, you 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 speak about a very specific focus, but um, when I am asking questions about why people sing a certain repertoire in a certain village context, mm -hmm. I think I'm asking very basic questions about what it means to be human. Uh -huh. You know, because music is related to the whole. Actually, yes. Yeah, Act of of living, of of living in a certain way, of finding your own position in in inside a village community. Mm -hmm. So it's really related to bigger questions about life, you yeah. know. And for me, there is no difference between reading Nietzsche or Wittgenstein or talking to a Chinese peasant, because we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about why are we here. What are we doing in life? You know, mm -hmm. how do we find our direction? I think those questions are inherent in music. Music mm -hmm. making for me is a process of seeking and finding. And so I don't think it's small, you know, Actually, even you're if, right, if you're right. You're right. I was I was completely wrong about saying like <laughs> it's small thing. I just we, we're talking only about appearance, you know, but then yeah, when so we just go into detail, we see how it's, deep it can go it's yeah. focused it's focused <laughs> in a small village in a small area a certain dialect yes in that sense you're right yeah. but you know there is a deeper a deeper world behind that um let's take the example of epic songs we've been looking at epic ap epic songs you know these very long songs that go on for days singers are reluctant to go to the end of such songs Mm -hmm. They don't want to sing the end for you, which is why uh, researchers in China always say, oh, I found a still longer version. Uh -huh. still, yes, because they don't want to sing the end. Why don't they want to sing to the end? Because they're afraid they will die. You know, that actually finishing the song wow. is, is, is akin to inviting fate to end their life. Wow. So that means that singing a song is not just simply an act of performance, but it's somehow related to your fate and your whole position in, 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 in being. Um, when you sing to entertain, when you sing love songs, mm -hmm. this can be for fun. Mm -hmm. It can be just, you know, uh, I challenge you to be more clever than me. I, I sing some very pretty naughty things and you <laughs> sing naughty things back to me mm -hmm. but it can also be actually an act of finding partners mm -hmm. and those partners can be your partners only for uh, the period of sexual intercourse mm -hmm. um, or it can be for a longer period that mm -hmm. depends on which part of China you're in mm -hmm. but there is actually a situation where women can only go to festivals when they are married 
because uh -huh. they tend to get pregnant in those festivals uh -huh. and if they are married nobody asks questions you know when they get pregnant you know there there is the uh, temple festivals are auspicious events mm -hmm. when the gods are invited to come to the temples mm -hmm. also from neighboring gods mm -hmm. and gods from other temples mm -hmm. they come to one specific temple and mm -hmm. that's the time to pray to basically ensure that you know your harvest will be right uh -huh. you get a good crop uh, nobody will fall ill or people who are ill get cured and your own offspring will be protected so mm -hmm. you see the elder generation praying for offspring in the temples and the younger generation outside the temples is basically arranging it by singing these love songs I see. and they can get pregnant in a festival and they get home afterwards their marriages, uh, traditionally speaking, were not ne necessarily consumed because it was parents arranging those marriages. So you didn't, you know, maybe you were married to a guy in his 60s or his 70s who was not necessarily even capable of giving you any children. But you, as a woman, if you don't get children, you're failing in your, you know, in your natural duty. So that's a... People won't talk about the guy. They will always talk about the woman, you know, there's something wrong with her. So she has to oblige. And this is one poss possibility. We had it here in Carnival. You know, Carnival was a yeah, traditional yeah. situation where lots of people would pick up basically their yeah, pregnancies. Yeah. Um, it happens worldwide. This is, uh -huh. not a, this is not a Chinese... Um, when I did talks about this in China, lots of people would say in, in Beijing and Shanghai and the universities, they would say, oh, but this must be something of minorities, you know, no, this, this <laughs> cannot be the Han Chinese. I said, come on, uh, yeah. you know, this is, it's a human thing. It's yeah, a human yeah, thing. Yeah. And you can either, if you cannot get children in your own marriage, you can either adopt, yeah. which lots of people do, uh, yeah. you know, they adopt sons or you can breed sons by, by picking them up in festivals. And this was a very natural method. So <laughs> singing is really about life and death. Wow. And when you look at, they have these processions, mm -hmm. long processions from a, a local god coming from a temple in somewhere in the countryside to mm -hmm. a more urban temple. I see. They turn it into a kind of race. Wow. which god is coming faster. there first is wow. faster than the other one because the one who comes first will be closest to the most important god in that urban temple and if they meet each other in the countryside mm -hmm. you know two processions coming from different villages they may fight wow and even people may kill each other wow. over it because you know this is about hierarchy it's about economy it's about prestige it's about all these things that show you, shows you how, how tremendously important religion is and how much it affects society on, on deeper levels mm -hmm. and how much it counts for the people. Mm -hmm. And some of the most ardent believers, you know, they always, they always say the Communist Party is, you know, they, they mm -hmm. want to push the superstition <laughs> out. But they are the strongest believers, at least in rural China. Yeah. You know, I so often met these these party people who they sure. are the they are the leaders in those <laughs> see, rituals see. you know so so um, and of course communism is also a religion you know yeah, it's the so same thing different. it's the same thing i don't need to tell you yeah, it's, a russian. <laughs> it's okay but actually uh, how uh, is, is this uh, temples are uh, buddhist temples or taoist or some uh, they can be various creeds but yeah buddhism is very common taoist is very common confusion is still mm -hmm. common in certain areas of china mm -hmm. of course it depends on and you have folk religion which is often a blend of all these things uh -huh. you know it's not always so very what, clearly what temples defined what are you talking about festivals is a kind of folk temples uh, they all have you know they may all be connected to festivals these can be calendar days for specific gods uh, mm -hmm. uh, they can be specific rituals mm -hmm. um, so so uh, there are all sorts of you know uh, 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 reasons to have uh, fairs and they attract lots of people and you know the the, the official story in Chinese books about this uh, when they talk about the singing near the temples is well you know they they just attract big crowds 
Uh -huh. So uh, naturally they will also start love songs. But this is nonsense because markets also attract lots of crowds, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but they don't sing at markets, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. They don't sing in any big crowd, they will just sing in specific temples and not every temple. So, so there is a, a clear religion, a religious connection here, mm -hmm. a ritual connection. And it's quite clear that it has to do with offspring um, because most, most of the gods in the temples that we are investigating are fer fertility gods. Uh -huh. And so our fertility goddesses, I should say, is usually women. And um, you see these women always with a little baby on their lap. Uh -huh, and um, uh -huh. the baby is always a boy because it's all about boys. You know, girls are not important. You have to get rid of girls. But boys, they continue the line, the family line. Yeah. So it's always about boys. You have people breaking off the penises of these <laughs> little boys that they crunch and then put in their soup and then they, you know, then they will make sure that the next boy that is, or the next baby that's born is a boy. Wow. Yeah, there's, there's all these, uh, all these, um, yeah, local beliefs that are geared towards, yeah, male offspring. You told about Gansu, but uh, also the similar uh, celebrations like uh, temple festivals, of course, present in other provinces. Oh also. yes, in Yunnan, in the south, it's temple yeah. festivals yeah. all over China. Not yeah. not in every area, but it's you can find it. Yeah. All but you just over uh, China. mostly was focused on Gansu because of research. Gansu, Qinghai, no, not. But you have to focus on a certain region because it needs time to get into the language. It needs uh -huh. time to understand who the local gods are, how the local history is connected to the uh -huh. temple. You know, the temple gods are not just gods, they are generals. Uh -huh. These generals have really existed, like Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong yeah. is a god now in some temples. Yeah. Well, before him, there were other generals and yeah. other big bosses who became gods. Yeah. And that is, that is history. And how that history is interconnected is something you can only yeah sort out by reading about local history. I cannot do that in, you know, in all of China. It's too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. too much. So you have to focus. Mm -hmm. You have to focus. But no, you would f you would definitely find similar similar phenomena in other parts of China. So so interesting story. Maybe maybe I think uh, for this for for now it's 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 uh, how to say even big picture. But uh, if we just uh, try to compress it, uh, uh, what do you get actually from all of this? How do you feel that what I spent so long time in China? And what is your, how to say, um, feeling if, if you say it more compact uh, about uh, your experience? You mean in terms of what I find out about what is there or how it how, how it affects faster. me personally? Yeah, or, personally. You no, know, it becomes a way of life to deal with Chinese music. And I think what is most precious in, in all the work that I do is, is learning to know people, understanding life in, in deeper and better mm -hmm. ways. And I think it has turned me into a more complete sort of human being by mm -hmm by going there. I'm, I'm far from mature, you know, I mm -hmm. still have the sense that I just started life. Yeah, I see. But I do realize that I've I've come a long way in, in getting a better understanding of of yeah what it means to be human. And that could have, you know, it could have been another area, another part of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that China teaches you better in that respect, but it has worked like that for me. Yeah, great story. Thank you very much, Frank. It was a very interesting interview and hopefully maybe we will meet again sometime and uh, welcome to our club all the time if we will maybe make some uh, also events. So please guys, uh, there was uh, some links to your foundation also and to Frank personal page uh, on Facebook if you want to contact him for some reason. And also, yeah, stay in touch. Thank you very much for watching and thank you, Frank, very much. It was a great interview. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Perfect.